Good evening, church. Open to Nehemiah chapter 6. Hey, Suze. I hear that uh, the inflation in Venezuela is what, 400%? The inflation rate in Venezuela is at 400%? Almost a thousand. And then last week, the president gave everybody a 40% increase. So with his brain, he understands things are spiraling out of control so much. Uh, also on the, uh, on the sermon Sunday morning, I hope you're all taking that challenge to heart, the uh, complaint free. If you've uh, tried putting this thing around your wrist, I know what you're doing. You're complaining. It's way too tight. <laughs> you can buy them online if you want to. You can get two for about two dollars or something. I just put mine around my watch and it keeps slipping down, but I don't complain. And I got to take Darwin's car today back to the garage so they could reset everything. I was so friendly and so nice that the guy I was talking to never stopped smiling. And he told me what you do in the future. You turn the ignition on and you pump the gas pedal three times and it resets your oil to 100%. So you see, because I was nice, I got given a really good tip that I could tell everybody else. It was so, so easy. All right, um, and now we are looking at chapter 6. What we are trying to get is, out of Nehemiah, is we're trying to look at Nehemiah as a leadership workbook. So the discussions that I would like to have is I would like you all to share your very best leadership advice, preferably as we come across a scripture that uh, falls in line with that. Chapter uh, 4, we see that they had a war. Uh, Nehemiah had to arm everybody. Chapter 5, they had internal strife with the rich people trying to gouge the poor people and making them slaves. And then we'd come to chapter 6, and the wall is just about finished, but there's still holes in the wall where there are gates. So if you have a house, and you have to be sleeping in enemy territory in your house, and your house does not have a front door and a back door, would you be nervous? See, the work's not done, right? The important part of the work, the most vulnerable part of the city, isn't fortified yet. So it's got to be done. And you would think, well, Satan's going to take a back seat, and he doesn't. He hits them with, with four different things. And uh, I've got them listed as trickery, insinuation, panic, and sneak in. When I was looking at this today, I changed them a little bit more just to give myself some insight. Uh, the first thing that he comes with, and uh, Jeff, can I have the clicker, or, or yeah, let me just get the clicker from Jeff, and I'll be, just put it where I need it. That's the easiest. Thanks, Jeff. Um, when I looked at verses 1 through 4, I saw the way the devil attacks us is repetition. So over here, repetition. He's going to come five times, and it reminds me of Samson and Delilah. Uh, how many times does Samson have to have this happening before he's going to realize there's something wrong here? Uh, Emma Gewen has got a nice little bracelet, one that doesn't choke off your blood. And it's Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and it says, live like this. And it's about setting aside, you know, the sins that so easily beset and having this great cloud of witnesses. I mean, how many times has the devil come at us the same way, the same method, the same everything before you're going to say, wait a minute, there's something here. So the way you get out of repetitive sin is prioritize, prioritize. If you give in, you give in to the witness of Christ. You stain the witness of Christ. And it's such a shame. And then we come to this one. Uh, in, in insinuation, and we'll see that there's an open letter being sent, and the, what I've got there is rumors. And so these are things that the, that the elders have to deal with. Uh, elders, let's talk about the first one. Have we ever had a problem in this church where there was repetition, where there was one person or one uh, or two people or a family continually, continually, continually coming up with problems and normally the same thing? Sometime you have to say, wait a minute, let's prioritize. Let me make it real simple. Who are the teachers here? Okay, Cheryl, who else? Doreen, okay, we've got Betty. Uh, what do you do if you've got a class of, uh, let's say, 20 kids, and they're pretty, pretty uh, wild kids, you know, they've got a lot of energy, and one kid is giving a lot of trouble, what do you do? 
Do you sacrifice the 19 by focusing just on the one? Yes. Okay. You, you, but you, you, you thought through it and you realized it's the same thing and it's not going to go away. Change the rules on this kid. You know? Uh, if the kid doesn't want to play by these rules, let's just keep, keep uh, no sense the whole class suffering. So it's a difficult thing for elders to have to deal with. Because in, in the case of elders, uh, you have to say to, uh, uh, let's see, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, who were the two people that were being dealt with over there? Who, who is it? No, no, that's Philippians 4. Uh, it's very close. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. It's not Hymenius and Alexandria. Alexander, who is it? First Timothy, just about there, verse 18. It is Hymenaeus and Alexander. Okay. Sorry, it was on the tip of my tongue and I should have just trusted myself. These two guys were causing trouble, and so look what has to happen. This charge I commit to you, son, uh, to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you should wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which, having, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander whom I deliver to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme that's a hard thing for elders to do you know what elders are they shepherds you know what shepherds do they bring in the sheep for them to do that goes completely against their nature but you've got to look at that uh, look at John chapter 15, for example. Uh, in John chapter 15, we have a fruit tree. We have a vine and we have branches. What has to happen every now and again if you want the, the, the grapes to grow? You have to prune. You know, we, what we like to do is we like to just sit and wait for the rotten fruit to drop down. Sometimes that's not good. Sometimes you have to actually go ahead and say, I've got to prioritize here. It's, it's a leadership thing. Only leaders can do this. Nobody else can do it. It's a tough call. It's a tough call. It's not made lightly. It's not made unless you have repetitively tried. How many times did Nehemiah tell them, no, I'm not going to come down to oh no? Five times, you know? They weren't getting the message. <laughs> and so he's going to hand them over. Okay, and then rumors. How many times have you had to deal with rumors? How many times in your leadership capacity have you dealt with rumors? What does rumors do to people? Is it good? No, it's not good. It's not good. How do you deal with rumors? Open letter with an open letter. You, you, have, to, you have to rebut it to the same extent that, that you get it. If somebody is standing over you and they're doing this, then you've got to get up out of your chair and you've got to do exactly the same, use the same language they're using or they're not going to understand you. It's not, it's not the kind of thing you want to do. But you, 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 must, uh, you must oppose the devil, not, over, not go overboard, not do more, not, don't try to drop a nuclear bomb, but whatever he's doing, you've got to open it up. He's got to switch on the light. Yes. Somebody would start talking about somebody else. Yes. Kind of talking rumors and stuff. He'd pull their pad out. Yes. Oh, I'm going to write this down. When I see them, I want to make sure I got all the details right. Whoa, that's great. <laughs> that is great. Yes, yes, excellent. If there's one elder out of five elders, for instance, that listens to rumors, what's the church going to do? They will, I promise you, they'll go to that one elder that that thrives on the negativity, that wants to hear it. I don't say he wants to hear it. I don't say he's thriving, but that's what they think. And they will go to that one elder. And it's a hard thing to break. Ms. Betty? Yes. 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 
lance it, drain it, purge it, put it open in the sunlight, or medicate it. Mercurochrome, or something worse. <laughs> and mercurochrome's calm compared to that other stuff. There was some stuff that was just the same when I was growing up, and it burned. Mercurochrome was calm compared to that stuff. <laughs> I hated this. I don't know, it was probably pure alcohol. You know? uh, any case, you've got to deal with it. You co- but, 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 let me just make sure you understand this. You first try to let the problem go away. You first ignore it. First, give it a chance to go away. Most of the time, it's going to go away. If it doesn't go away, and you are openly challenged, let's say the elders, according to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, specifically verse 19 and 20, have two or more witnesses that come and make an accusation against them, against one of them, and it's normally got to do with the qualifications of 1 Timothy chapter 3 or Titus chapter 1, and there's an open accusation, and it's written down, and it's signed. What does that elder have to do? If that elder ignores it, what will the church think? They'll think it's true. So you ignore it until something like that happens, and then you've got to deal with it openly, unfortunately. Now, I don't like to deal with conflict. I will rather do anything but that. I'll rather go to the cross and be martyred. But that's, this is what leaders do, and this is what the book is telling us to do. And then we'll get to religion. In verses 10 through uh, 14, there's a religious attack uh, coming, and what happens is he uses one of the priests, uh, Satan uses one of the priests, and the guy is staged in the house, he's homebound, and he says, let's go to the temple, and let's lock ourselves up in the temple. Remember that one? And uh, because they're going to come and attack you, and by the way, when are they going to come and attack you? They're going to come and attack you at night. You know, you would think everything, but if you're in the temple and we barred in the temple, we'll be okay. Nehemiah is not allowed to go into the temple. That's a religious problem. And the way Nehemiah discerned it is he knew what the word was. <clears throat> if you go against the word, even if you're going to get killed, even if you're going to get hurt, no, sorry, you stick with the word, even if it's going to cost you your life, you stick with the word, right? It's never okay to go against God's word. It's never okay. Uh, in, uh, in the church, uh, the first century church, all they were doing is they were bringing in circumcision. Was that a biblical thing? Yes, it was biblical even. It was scriptural. They were trying to bring in a scriptural thing. And what did, Timothy, what did Paul do? No, right? How will people know that we are Christians according to John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35? By their love, by our love, they will know we are Christians, right? Not by our doctrine, but by our love. So we should let, because we love each other, we should be tolerant with each other, and we should uh, let the, uh, we should set, set aside the doctrine. Is that true? No, it's not true. It, it, you may come across as unloving. You may come across as a bully. You may, it doesn't matter. You always stick with the word. And don't stick with your version of the word. My, my, my uh, um, suggestion is if you have something that you think is scriptural, get four or at least four, maybe eight of your brethren and get into a room, close the door, stay there for three hours if need be and talk it out until you have agreement, until you have uh, Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. One mind. And you can apply verses 5 through 11 of Philippians 2 to see how Jesus did it. So you have religion there. So you have repetition, the first one. You have rumors, and then you have religion. He'll bring religion in. And then the last one I've got there is revolt. He's going to use Tobias, and he's going to use some of the nobles, and they're going to write lots of nice letters to Tobias, and Tobias is going to write a lot of nice letters back, and uh, they're trying to sneak in this bad guy. Tobias is one of the enemies. He's one of the guys from the start who did not have the wall built. But what does the last verse in chapter 6 say? What does is, what is, uh, Nehemiah figure out about this guy, Tobias? Wa- who wanted to make me afraid. So that's basically what we see happening over here. And so what we did is we looked at the mousetrap in this first one <clears throat> about repetition. And uh, we saw that how he prioritized. He says, I'm doing a good work. Must I come down? And then we come across the rumors, the insinuation, and the rebuttal. Uh, he's going to re- have rebuttal with prayer. So we did all of those. Let me just see where we are. 
Uh, I think uh, I forgot to write it in the notes, in the overhead notes. So just let me look on my notes where we are. Uh, let me just see. I may be skipping over a few here. Uh, can you get me to the bullseye, Jeff? I'll pick it up from the bullseye. Yes. Okay, let's talk about the bullseye just a little bit. Who do you think the devil puts a bullseye on? On us? Who else? On the leaders. He's going to put bullseyes on the leaders. That's his number one target. So right now he's targeting the, uh, uh, Nehemiah. We do have the Holy Spirit that makes it a little bit easy for us. Okay, and then we, we did that one. And then chapter 5, and then we come to insinuation. Okay, there we go. And I don't have it on, but we meant to start over here. Last week uh, I read, read that. In other words, you leave it alone until you see that you can't leave it alone anymore. And that's what the second part of this, uh, this writing over there that I didn't include, but that's what it said. All right, so uh, insinuation or rebuttal, and you have prayer. Uh, and so let's uh, just skip on to the next one and get into some of the conversation there. What did Nehemiah do in chapter 6, verse 8? No such things as you ha say have been done, uh, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. And so he openly is refuting this. Verse 9, for they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. And so we've got to illustrate this uh, part of the solution to our lives uh, when, when Satan's coming in and he's creating these types of rumors uh, in our own lives, we need to pull God into it, realize what's happening, but not uh, act out of fear. So let's go to the, last one, the second last one, panic. Panic goes to obedience. And here we'll see the religious problem. Uh, now when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his house. Now, sometimes these prophets confine themselves when they want to stage a prophetic scene. So this might have been what was happening as to why he was confined. He was confined to his home. He said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. So he's very specifically telling him, we're going to do something that goes against God's word. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. And so he, he's, saying, he's creating a theological uh, uh, controversy here, and he's putting fear into it. How do we do this? How, have you ever seen this done? Have you ever seen somebody coming and they try to get you to do something that is against the Bible or in your company, against your company's rules, and they use uh, fear to convince you to do that? Have you ever seen anything like that done? Yes. Okay, so, so there's a lot of fear being created all over the place uh, in, in, the in the politics to get us to vote for somebody that we may not want to vote for. Okay, very good. Uh, just, just pay careful attention to your company. Uh, there are very, very strict rules that your companies have set in place, and every now and then somebody's going to try to bend those rules. And, and you, know what, you know what your policy says. Don't, don't bend them. And it will normally be, well, th those rules were there for the last generation. They have not been updated. It's not for our generation now, and we've got to update these things or something like that. But always remember what God's Word says or the laws of the country that you represent. Mm -hmm. Churches are living in space that are against scripture because we're told that the upcoming generation won't have it because mm -hmm. of secular life, whatever. Yes. 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 And then our hands will drop and we will be afraid. So w when we hear that type of thing, we mustn't refocus ourselves. Sometimes what we do is when somebody comes up with something like that, we react. And we go completely the opposite instead of, you know, being balanced uh, with us. So we've seen a lot of these things, but always keep in mind what the Word is saying. Don't let the devil talk up. Don't let his 
uh, his voice be heard, but keep your perspective. And then it says, um, they come in to kill you, uh, and then this is what he's saying, and you can hear him thinking to himself, but I said, should such a man as I run away? So on the one hand, I'm a leader of, these, of the situation, must I run away? On another hand, I'm humble. Here he comes. And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? See the humility there? I can't do that. Okay? Uh, and, and you're going to see some really bad things happen with somebody actually moving into the temple before Nehemiah is over, and Nehemiah is going to throw that person out with everything. So it, mm-hmm. Yes. You know something's wrong about what's being taught when all their teachers just fear monger. Thank you. It's not because, you know, perfect love will cast out fear. And so there's no aspire of love, there's no fear between us. And there's nothing wrong with standing up and telling somebody, here's a problem. Be aware of it, be concerned about it. Yes. Exactly. The opposite of fear is faith. Faith is the word of God. Almost everything in chapter 6 was fear, fear, fear. Elders, you have to stand firm. You have to have faith. Uh, You have to know that there's something other than this world. God, remember these people. Boy, that guy's in trouble. (laughs) You know, you got you got the the guy who God put in charge. They're they're telling, you know, and it's not a rumor because he's talking to God about it. All right, let's close the word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this uh, information that you've given us today. We thank you so much for our leaders, for those, Father, who will be future leaders in this congregation, and for all of us who are bright, shining lights and in such a, se- in such a sense leaders in our communities. Please, Father, help us to live this uh, golden deed life, this, uh, this idea of doing unto others as we would have them to do to us, the idea of not being complaint a driven people, and as Steve mentioned again today, not driven by fear, uh, but rather f- by faith and the hope that you've placed inside of us. Thank you, God, for the heavenly home that you've prepared for us. Father, we thank you so much that we are candidates for that home covered by the blood of your Son. Please, Father, continue to forgive us of our sins. Help us to be blameless and not to make the elders' a task uh, a, a hard thing, but, uh, but uh, something of great joy. Thank you, Father. Give them good health and long life. It's through your Son's name we pray. Amen.